All right. So, we made our way through looking at the history of dinosaurs, their biology, and some of their contemporaries, and now we have to bring these things to an end. So the next several lectures are going to take a look at the end of the age of dinosaurs, um, when it was, what happened, what caused it, and uh, associated phenomena with that. And that'll take us almost to the end of the course, then there'll be last couple lectures that will look at dinosaurs in the modern world, not so much about birds, which are indeed dinosaurs in the modern world, but how dinosaurs have influenced popular culture and additionally issues concerning the science and the study of dinosaurs and the ownership of fossils and so forth. But first things first. So the end of the age of dinosaurs and the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs is one of the most um, conspicuous parts of the fossil record, and consequently one that shows up a lot in popular culture. So these are just a small fraction of the cartoons that I have uh, about the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction, or the extinction of the dinosaurs, however one wants to have it. This one would work so much better if they actually used a dinosaur rather than a mastodont. Uh, so an elephant line animal here. Um, and they should have cut back on gluten. Uh, here's a bunch more. So they're, uh, they're not really extinct. They're living under assumed names in Argentina. Um, here we got a bunch of this. So we got climate change, volcanic ash, and so forth. God turned up the gravity. And the idea that um, the asteroid is responsible for their extinction made its way into popular culture pretty early on. By the way, this, this right here, this is the original version of this cartoon, which gets spread around with all sorts of new captions. This is the original one from back in the 80s or early 90s. Um, and a severe asteroid warning. Uh, this was actually from the Diamondback <laughs> way back when. In fact, I didn't actually take the class with me, but. Uh, this Professor Plum in the Lake Cretaceous with a lead pipe. Uh, the enthusiasm of Dinosaur Astronomy Club, which short lived. Um, so, yeah, this is a, a phenomenon, an event that's of great interest to a lot of people. And of course, it's not just dinosaurs. So, here are the couple triceratops lamenting ichthyosaurs are all gone, mosasaurs are gone, pterosaurs are gone. There's none of the old crowd left. And then this ennobling one where uh, paleontology checks have changed a lot since dinosaurs took over the school board. Save yourself, Neville. We will fend off the asteroids. And of course, in doing so, they get their appropriate reward in the great raptor rapture at the end of the Cretaceous. OK, so before we deal with the specifics of the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction, we'll have to deal with what mass extinctions are. And before we deal with mass extinctions, we'll need to deal with other extinctions as well. So what is an extinction? Um, well, depending upon your flavor of biology, you might finesse it slightly differently, but it all basically means the same thing. So a traditional biologist, a whole organism biologist, uh, we might think of extinction as when the last member of a species or an entire clade dies out. So paleontology, you know, that's the way we sort of approach extinction. A geneticist might think it's you got extinction when a genome is no longer being passed on. So they're more interested in the information aspect of it rather than the individual. And an ecologist might think about sort of the species range or the clade range goes to zero. That is the, the space occupied by those organisms um, in the world. But they all mean basically the same thing. There ain't no more of them. So, you know, there's dodos, a uh, skeleton, and a reconstructed. Um, life uh, appearance of one, a model of one, and, and a great exemplar of extinction. Indeed, they were one of the first animals for which Western science recognized that extinction could occur. Now, dodos were a sort of flightless pigeon on the island of Mauritius. Um, they were not particularly bright animals, and they weren't particularly stupid, unlike you know the people give them the impression of. They were sort of fearless animals. Um, in that they didn't have many natural predators. And humans arrived on the island 
of Mauritius. They could hunt them. And even more so, the pigs and the rats they released on the island ate their eggs. And the dodos disappeared. And this gave people the idea that recognized that species could go extinct. And from that idea, Georges Cuvier, we haven't seen him in a while. Go back to your early notes. We talked about him a bit. He was the sort of one of the guys who helped develop comparative anatomy, one of the first vertebrate paleontologists. Uh, and one of the main things he's famous for is recognizing the existence of natural extinctions. Because he was one of the first people who was able to go and look at these skeletons that people were digging up in various spots of the world and show via comparative anatomy that they were not the same creatures that we see today, that a mastodon is not an elephant. It is a member of the elephant group, but it is neither an African nor an Indian elephant. It's an extinct elephant. Or that Mosasaurus was a giant seagoing lizard that we just don't see in the world today. So the recognition that there were natural extinctions. I should throw out there, because I don't think I mentioned this in the original lecture when I talked about Cuvier. He had a colleague from North America who disagreed with him about the, ability, about the possibility of natural extinctions. Um, and additionally, that colleague and Cuvier and other, and for that matter, uh, some of his uh, other French uh, uh, contemporaries were sort of had a big disagreement because the French pointed out that, you know, in the old world, in Eurasia and Africa, we have all these magnificent creatures there, but you, you silly Americans, you have nothing. You know, bison and moose are the biggest animals you have. Um, well, this particular colleague was rather offended by that, and he had found himself, had found fossils or described fossils of giant animals in the New World, including the Mastodon. It's an obscure little uh, natural philosopher called Thomas Jefferson. Uh, among men, his many other attributes, Jefferson was actually a paleontologist. Um, and indeed, when Jefferson was in a position of power, namely the President of the United States of America, uh, he got a petition to explore some of this new territory that uh, they had acquired from Napoleon uh, as part of the, well, uh, the Louisiana Purchase, and therefore, uh, these, he, was, he granted Lewis and Clark the petition to go out there and explore, but part of their charter was they were supposed to bring back living mastodons and, and other giant megafauna, because what Jefferson figured is that they were still alive, but they had been wiped out regionally in the east um, due to you know, diseases spread from European animals and so forth, but they were still alive somewhere in the interior. Um, however, Jefferson's hypothesis that they were still alive proved to be incorrect, as you all know. And indeed, uh, people recognized, yes, extinction did happen. Cuvier also helped recognize what we would now call mass extinctions. Now, he didn't call them that. That was a term from the 20th century. Um, but he and colleagues noted that there were moments in Earth history, at least by a direct literal reading of the rock record, where many groups disappeared. And then above those, the layers above there, you have some time before you start to reestablish diverse forms. And so uh, these would later be called mass extinctions. He called them revolutions. Um, but mass extinctions are the geologically rapid extinction of many distantly related taxa which are not immediately replaced in ecological space. So the idea here is that um, it's not just the background level of extinction. That's going on all the time. You know, species are always going extinct and being replaced by new ones. But this is a rapid, not necessarily instantaneous, but rapid loss of many distantly related forms. And a consequence of this phenomenon is that the world is left impoverished in terms of its ecology after a mass extinction. There are many ways of life, niches, that are not being occupied for a while. It takes a while for things to re-evolve to occupy those spots. Whereas in background extinctions, you normally have another form that's coming in to replace it right away. In fact, it may be a case of competitive uh, replacement that's going on. And these transformations were used as the basis for some period boundaries, so geological periods, and especially for the big era boundaries the boundaries between the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic, 
That's the Permo Triassic mass extinction, which we talked about before, the biggest of all mass extinctions, and the one between the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, the one at the end of the age of dinosaurs, also a mass extinction. So, in fact, here was the database that was used in the original study that proposed breaking the periods of Earth history up into slightly larger units called eras. And, and we see here is a list of, or a, a database of marine invertebrates scaled to 100% over here and shown as total number of species over here, color-coded to represent different groups, and Phillips, the guy who, uh, who created this database, showed that there were these distinct shifts in Earth history where the, the makeup of the marine community radically changed. Similarly, in the database he was using, he saw that the, uh, the amount, the diversity of forms crashed at certain occasions. And in fact, those are mass extinction events, and those became the boundary for the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic and Cenozoic. In fact, that's what he, what he used to break it up into Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. He also, well, I didn't point it out in this version of it, he actually picked up two more mass extinctions, but didn't recognize them as such. This is actually the Triassic Jurassic extinction, and this is the Late Devonian extinction. It's there in his database. He didn't just he didn't highlight it because they weren't as profound as the other two. Now, before we get much further, I want to introduce a term, and then we'll never use it again. Well, we might. I might touch on it, but it's not a term. The term you should know, but it's a term you should know that is obsolete. And that is the tertiary period. In the old days of stratigraphy, the Cenozoic era, the age of mammals, all the time since the end of the Cretaceous, was divided into two periods, the tertiary and the quaternary. However, the tertiary represented a block of time from basically 66 to 1.8 million years ago. And so on a first and probably on a second and third order approximation, it was exactly the same thing as the Cenozoic. Um, it was a traditional term. Um, and now we regard, yeah, now we don't use the tertiary formally. The commission that is in charge of international stratigraphy and the, in, and the individual governmental organizations in charge of stratigraphy, like for in the US, it's the US Geological Survey, have sort of decommissioned it. The tertiary is not a real period anymore. And instead, we use the Paleogene for the earlier part and the Neogene. Now, the symbol for the tertiary was a capital T. In fact, it was the only period that began with a T. Um, and if you recall, the symbol for the Cretaceous is a capital K. And so for a long time, for generations, this boundary was called the KT boundary. And people of a certain age, including me, will revert to calling it the KT boundary um, just by accident, because that's the way we were raised. But it isn't properly that anymore. It's the KPG boundary, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. So Andy, let's talk about what this um, event is. So we could refer to the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction or Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction, which is between the Cretaceous period of the Mesozoic era and the Paleogene period of the Cenozoic era. But as I said, traditionally, it was called the Cretaceous tertiary extinction or the KT extinction. Sometimes people will refer to the boundary event because the extinction is ultimately just a biological phenomenon. It's the loss of species. So by putting it in this context, the boundary event is the biological phenomena and all the physical phenomena associated with it. So it sort of expands our concept of it. So the KPG or the KT boundary event. Or we can talk about the terminal Cretaceous extinction or boundary event. It's at the end of the Cretaceous. Or the end Mesozoic extinction. Or if we want to go fine-tuned, we have eras like Mesozoic and Cenozoic. We have periods like Cretaceous and Paleogene. Uh, we have epochs like the Late Cretaceous and the Paleocene epoch. Or we can go down to the fine grain, which is the age or stage. And the stage, the last stage of the Cretaceous is called the Maastrichtian. Um, after the town of Maastricht in Holland, uh, which is relevant to uh, 
to, uh, paleo uh, to, to paleontology of reptiles of the Cretaceous, because that's what Mosasaurus, that's where Mosasaurus was discovered. And in fact, the moss here and Mosa are from the same word. So the terminal Maastrichtian extinction, or the Maastrichtian Danian extinction, the Danian is the very first stage of the Paleocene epoch of the Paleogene period of the Cenozoic era. All mean the same thing. It means that. And in geology, there is a particular spot in the world, a physical spot, where a committee of scientists agree upon that this marker, this bed, is the physical embodiment of that boundary. And that we refer back to it when we're trying to calculate like the, eight, the beginning of that time period. So there's a spot, in this case, in Tunisia, a particular layer where the sedimentology of the rocks changes dramatically. It is not the only place in the world where there's a dramatic change, but this particular one shows it well. It's called El Kef. And so if you want to you know, fly out to Tunisia, you can go and check it out yourself and see that boundary. All right, but it is famous not for being a, you know, a spot on the stratigraphy of Tunisia, but rather it is famous for the end of the age of dinosaurs and the beginning of the age of mammals. But let's just remember, this is not the end of the dinosaurs themselves. Dinosaurs are the concestor of Diplodocus, Megalosaurus, and Iguanodon, and all of its descendants. So we have lots of dinosaurs in the world today. And we've had groups of dinosaurs that existed in the Cenozoic, which have since gone extinct. So dinosaurs are still with us. Now. Depending upon the exact way you count it, there are five really big mass extinctions in Earth history. There are a couple more people notice that, depending upon the exact database you use, that might be comparable to the big five, or alternatively, that you might lose one of these. But in the big five, the Cretaceous Paleogene is the most recent, the one 66 million years ago. Um, we've already seen in this course the Permo-Triassic extinction, the one that ended the age of synapsids and allowed the archosaurs to radiate, and then the one at the end of the Triassic, the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, which ended the age of the Pseudosuchian archosaurs, the croc lineage. Only a few groups of the croc lineage survived, and the dinosaurs, which were already present, then occupied that new niche space that was vacated. And so we now get to the Cretaceous Paleogene. Now it's notable, the Cretaceous Paleogene is not the biggest. That's the Permo-Triassic. The Permo-Triassic dwarfs the Cretaceous Paleogene. But the Cretaceous Paleogene one is the most recent. For a long time, it was the best studied, although the Permo-Triassic probably has that honor now. And from a, um, a sort of a biased point of view, we think of its importance because it started our world. It's what provided a world in which mammals were the dominant ones. So yes, it's a big event, but it's not the biggest. Depending upon the database you use, like over here on this database, looking at a uh, percentage of marine genera, mostly of invertebrates, it's the third largest. So this is the end of the Permian. This is the end of the Ordovician. And this is the Cretaceous one, so Moss from Maastrichtian. And under this database, there's the Permo-Triassic. There's the end Ordovician. Uh, this is one that's within the Permian. There's the Lake Devonian, and there's the Cretaceous. So, but it's a big one. Now, before we start exploring what caused the extinction and talking about the end of the age of dinosaurs, we have to look at what the extinction is and what is it that died out at the event. Because there's many things that died out other than non-avian dinosaurs. The, um, common misconcept that it's just dinosaurs or big reptiles that died out. That's far from the truth. Also, we need to survey what survived the event. Because remember, every living thing in the world today had an ancestor that survived that extinction. And indeed, that survived every extinction before that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. We would be extinct. And then we'll get around to looking at what caused the event. But first, a presidential metaphor. This is going to get a little weird, but hopefully it's useful. 
Um, we are talking about an historical event, an event that happened at a particular moment or slice of time. And there is a tendency for people to get sort of muddy when they think about history. So they get muddy thinking. So, for instance, we all know that World War II happened in the past. And we all know that George Washington and JFK are no longer with us. But just because World War II happened in the past, and JFK and George Washington are no longer with us, doesn't mean either of them died at World War II. Indeed, Washington, of course, was long dead at the time, and JFK actually fought in World War II as a Navy officer. So, yeah. Um, why do I say that? Because there is a tendency for people to say, oh, here's something that existed in the Cretaceous. It must have been a victim of the extinction event. But that's not necessarily true. It could have survived the event, or it could have died long before, so it could have either been like JFK, who survived it, or died out long before, like Washington. So let's take a look in the Cretaceous Seas. So moving our way down into the seas, we're going to start with the lower levels of the food chain. In, in terms of the number of individuals lost, probably the biggest victim of the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event are these sorts, and particularly the one on top. The guys on top are called Coccolithophorids. The long name for a very small thing. They're a type of phytoplankton, so single cell marine organisms that photosynthesize, so algae. They're, they make little plates of calcium carbonate. And you see in the middle is an example of one with the protoplasm removed, but this is the position in life, these little hubcaps. When they die and the protoplasm dissolves away, these hubcaps settle down to the seafloor, and they produce chalk. Now, remember, the name Cretaceous means chalk. The whole period is named after these guys, because they lived in such huge abundance in the warm, shallow waters of the world that we accumulated multiple kilometers thicknesses of their bodies in vast regions, so commonly that we call this whole period the Age of Chalk, hence Cretaceous. After this event, you don't generate chalk anymore. There's still coccolithophores. They survive as a group. You still have them today, but they've never lived at that abundance ever again. So that's the base of the food chain in the sea, or one of the bases of the food chain, photosynthesizers, phytoplankton, producers. You move up a, a step or two, you get these guys, foraminiferans. Foraminiferans also make shells out of calcium carbonate, but these are zooplankton. These are creatures that eat other creatures. They're basically armored amoebas. And they're much larger, actually. You can see a foram with the naked eye. You can't see the details, but you can see them. There's some, you can actually see some of the details on them. Some get up to the size of a quarter or more, but that would come, occur later on. These ones shown here, like a very small grain of rice or uh, a grain of salt. Forams do recover. In fact, they recover like gangbusters eventually. But both of these have catastrophic drops at the time. In fact, here's a look at a core. You saw something like this in the Smithsonian, one of these deep sea cores where we've got lots and lots and lots of big forams, and there's also lots of coccolithophorids. And then this disturbed layer. And then above it, rarer small forams. The foram, forams, by the way, short for foraminifera, they eventually recover. And forams are doing super well today. Uh, the nanofossils there, which include the coccolithophorids, they recover but never back to their old numbers. OK, let's move further up the food chain. There are lots of characteristic shellfish, marine invertebrates, of the Cretaceous. And here are three groups that die out at the KPG boundary. The aminoids. Aminoids are sort of the marine post poster children for the Mesozoic in the ways that dinosaurs are in the terrestrial realm. Although, to be fair, aminoids actually show up well before then. 
uh, but they die out at this boundary. They were super common beforehand. They're shelled cephalopods, so like a, like a nautilus in that context, like a modern nautilus. Um, but unlike the modern nautilus, which is a predator, a macro predator, it eats big chunks of fish and so forth, um, most of the late Cretaceous aminoids were planktonivores. They ate plankton. Now, earlier aminoids were, many of them were eating big chunks of flesh, but the late Cretaceous ones were typically planktonivores. Additionally, all aminoids had plankton larvae. So plankton isn't a group, it's a way of life, and it means a floater. So having a planktonic larvae means when their when little babies are floating around in the upper levels of the water, not under their own power, just floating around with, with the tides and the currents and so forth. This is in contrast to other cephalopods, like modern nautilus or squid, or cuttlefish or octopi, which have bigger eggs, but they lay down on the seafloor and often even wash over them. Then there are inoceramids. These are giant clams. They're not modern giant clams. They're an extinct group. They're actually closer to scallops than the giant clam is, the modern giant clam. And these seem to be chemosymbiotic. What does that mean? That means that they have, or had, in their gills, bacteria that lived with them, which absorbed chemicals from the water, and then they fed off the processes of those gills. And these guys seem to have liked it, particularly in sort of dark, muddy surfaces, where there's sort of organic goo coming out, bubbling out of the, the mud. And when I say big, I mean a single shell could be as tall as this, except they weren't tall, they were flat on the ground. But like that. They actually had pearls, but they had really low-grade pearls, otherwise the pearls that survive today have really broken down. But pearls up to the size of a softball. Um, and then these guys, belemnoids. Belemnoids are cousins of the aminoids, and really they're close to the ancestry of cuttlefish and squid and octopods and so forth. Uh, major, pr major prey for a lot of the marine reptiles, they die out. Oh, here's a reconstruction a modern reconstruction of an aminoid and probably a much more realistic set of, uh, of tentacles on it. They probably didn't have long, big, muscular tentacles to grab and, and hold things like an octopus. They, they were probably, especially these later forms, scooping in clouds of plankton. Another group of marine shellfish is another sort of clam, and these are called rudists. So rudists were the reef makers of the Cretaceous, particularly the late Cretaceous. The, um, prior to them, modern corals had already evolved, and they had been made, made, made most of the reefs. But in this really warm seas of the Cretaceous, it's actually the rudest clams that took over. And they produced these great big reefs. And just as today, reefs are a huge, were a huge part of the biodiversity in the sea. And the rudists die out entirely. Like modern giant clams, they probably had photosynthetic algae in their um, body tissues. Uh, actually, like giant clams and like modern corals. Some of you may have heard about coral bleaching, which is a phenomenon going on when the water gets too hot. The modern corals, uh, they can live, but they throw their little photosynthetic algae out, and then they don't grow their coral reefs as much. They're much slower in activity. These guys probably needed that, those photosynthetic algae to grow as much as they did. Okay, moving a little further up the food chain, or at least up into the vertebrates, both the bony fish and the cartilaginous fish, the sharks, undergo extinctions at this time. So this is not a swordfish. This is not a barracuda or a tarpon. This is from an entirely extinct group of uh, of bony fish. This is from a group, some of the groups never survived, but this guy, which was like up to about 12 feet long or so, they died out. And the big, in the seas of the Cretaceous, the main plankton-eating fish were not sharks as they are today. Today, the main plankton-eating, um, plankton eaters among fish are whale sharks, basking sharks, and uh, manta rays, which are a type of shark, rays are sharks. These were bony fish that were being the big plankton rams. And there were big sharks. 
Sharks as big as the biggest predatory sharks of today. And the Cretaceous group of big sharks dies out at the event. You can see it to scale with a mosasaur. So all the fish represented here, you know, this is not a tuna. That's not a barracuda. That's not a tuna. These are all groups that die out at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And notice that scale, one meter. So basically, the big pelagic fish, particularly the big predatory pelagic fish, and the planktonivore, G is the planktonivore, uh, they die out at this extinction event. Probably not a surprise, since some of their major food was dying out at the same time. So here are the planktonivores at the time. And it would take a little time geologically for there to be the resumption of big planktonivores in the seas. How about the marine reptiles? Well, plesiosaurs die out utterly. Both the long neck and short neck forms were present. Mosasaurs die out utterly. Hesperonithene birds die out other, utterly. On the other hand, the sea turtles and the marine crocs managed to survive. So on this figure here, we can see that ichthyosaurs already dead. Remember, they died at the beginning of the late Cretaceous. Sea turtles make it through. Marine crocs, particularly the dinosaurs, make it through and will die out later on. But the plesiosaurs, the mosasaurs, and the hesperornithines, they all die out at this event. How about on the continents? Well, there actually is a plant extinction at the end of the Cretaceous or it seems to be. They may have died out a little before that. Really, the big change isn't which groups were around and which ones weren't, but which ones were dominant and which ones weren't. The flowering plants, which were already becoming pretty common, switch so that when the forests recover, they become the dominant group of plants in those biomes, which they remain to this day. You know, it's really only up in cold regions, the taiga and so forth, pine forests and so forth, where the conifers really still dominate. Insects. So far as we can tell, no major insect group dies out at the extinction event. That said, we don't have a lot of... Well, the amber towards the end of the Cretaceous isn't as well studied as earlier Cretaceous amber is. And it might be that there are groups that die out. We just don't know that they were around yet. Um, but one thing we do see is that the amount of feeding damage on leaves decreases at the end of the Cretaceous for uh, several thousands of years. And that's impressive. It takes a lot to knock insects back. How about mammals? Well, there are many groups of mammals that were present in the Mesozoic but died out at the extinction event. Of course, some mammal groups survived. The monotremes survived, the last of the egg-laying mammals. The multi-tuberculates survived. They're dead now, but they survived the extinction event, and they do really well in the early Cretaceous. Sorry, the, the early Cenozoic. The marsupials survive. Still have them today. And the placentals. Our group obviously survives. And there were a few other sporadic survivors. But there were many branches of mammalia that didn't make it through. If we look at the cold-blooded reptiles and the amphibians, it looks like most of these groups make it through. Snakes and lizards and turtles and frogs and so forth. Although some particular branches, like the very largest crocodiles die out. Only small crocodilians make it through. The very largest turtles die out. And in fact, a lot of the diversity among crocodilia or, or crocodiles and their closest relatives gets decreased at this time because they were once far more diverse than they are now. Other groups survive but have since died out. So just to give two examples here, uh, this is a group of reptiles that was really common from the Triassic onward. They make it through the extinction event, but they are gone now, called Champsosaurus, for those who care. And this is a group of amphibians called albinerpetontids. They were amphibians that still had sort of a granular scales on their body. They almost made it to modern times. They made it within a few million years of modern times, but have since died out. Pterosaurs. 
Pterosaurs were present all the way up to the boundary, but died out. As I mentioned before, it's really two major groups of pterosaurs that were present at that time, both uh, toothless groups, and occupying basically only mid to large sizes. So sizes that weren't occupied by birds at that time. So not all KPG survivors made it to today. So just again, Champsosaurus, Divosaurus, Multitiverculates, all gone. These are like JFK and World War II. They're dead now, but they survived the event. So how about the big guys? How about the dinosaurs? Well, obviously, non-avian dinosaurs died out at the event. But it's important to note that not all dinosaurs died out at the KPG. Birds, of course, aves, toothless birds, survive. And many groups of non-avian dinosaurs didn't die out at the event because they weren't around anymore. So, brachiosaurids, diplodocids, robotosaurids, all long gone. You know, heterodontosaurs died out in the early Cretaceous. Herrerasaurs died out at the end of the Triassic, and so on and so forth. So stegosaurs don't come anywhere near the extinction event. Long dead, died out at the beginning of the early Cretaceous. So these, these guys are not victims of it at all. So that's a look at who survived and who died out. Now let's begin to shift our focus on what might have caused this event. What was the causal agent or trigger? So when we talk about an extinction event, there's some, typically a trigger or a causal agent that sets things in motion. And then that causal agent produces killing agents, sub uh, environmental effects that actually wind up killing the organism. So for instance, when we talk about an asteroid hitting the Earth, Yes, it squashed the things directly underneath it, but that's not the main cause. That's not the main way it causes an extinction. It's not the squishing that causes the extinction. It's not the lava from a supervolcano that causes an extinction. So, when we start trying to explore potential causal agents, and people have proposed hundreds of these for the Cretaceous. First of all, when they propose the causal agent, is it something that would only affect the dinosaurs? If so, we can toss it out, because obviously many things other than dinosaurs die down. Is it overkill? This is something that astrophysicists and geophysicists are really prone to do, is to come up with elaborate potential causes that would have been so extreme, nothing should have, should have survived. And there's a simple experiment to prove them wrong, and it's called taking your own pulse. If you have a pulse, that overkill hypothesis is wrong because your ancestors survived. Then something we might want to explore, is it a cause that has to do with the Earth? I'm using the old term telluric rather than terrestrial because terrestrial might confuse land versus sea, terrestrial versus marine. So telluric of the Earth or something cosmic from outer space. Is it a biological agent involved? Or is it something abiotic, something physical? Is it a causal agent that happens instantaneously on the scale of hours or weeks or months? You know, something gradual that occurs in the tens or hundreds or thousands of millions or millions of years scale or something in between? We'll have to check these against what we see in the pattern. Is it indeed just a single agent involved or maybe there were multiple agents? Was the thing that caused extinctions in the sea the same agent that caused the extinctions on land? Or were they different causes? And then, really fundamentally important, is the hypothesis testable? That is, is it falsifiable? Remember that basic attribute of science. If you were wrong, how would you know it? If you come up with a hypothesis that isn't testable, that is pure speculation. We shouldn't treat it seriously. And basically, in order to be testable, would that agent leave a record independent of the extinction itself? The extinction itself is not sufficient to be evidence of that agent. Because any, multi, any of your multiple working hypotheses should at least explain the extinction. If it doesn't explain the extinction, then it's not a useful explanation. We need a way of seeing, is there something else we can look at? some other line of evidence we can use 
to assess if that agent was present. So as I mentioned, you know, people have come up with lots of different uh, causes. And although some of these uh, are obviously silly, this is in fact from a comedy um, book. Um, some of these indeed are suggestions. So Earth struck by whipped cream pie, not so much. But there are some outdated ideas which are pretty silly, and some of them were even on that list. So did mammals eat all the eggs? So the idea was dinosaurs lay eggs. Maybe mammals evolved and ate all the eggs. Well, it's that mammals evolved about the same time as dinosaurs. They lived side by side for ages. There's no evidence of a new egg-eating form of mammal that appeared at the end of the Cretaceous. Additionally, there's no evidence that they, well, why would they eat them but not the champsosaur eggs or the crocodile eggs? And how would that possibly affect the coccolithophorids or the aminoids or things of that nature? Another one, we know the angiosperms, the flowering plants, evolved in the Cretaceous. So maybe dinosaurs were allergic to them, got constipation, or they sneezed themselves to death. Well, angiosperms evolved in the beginning of the Cretaceous, farther away from the end of the Cretaceous than today is from the end of the Cretaceous. And again, why would this affect the marine realm? The caterpillars eat all the plants. Lepid uh, Lepidopterans, the butterfly and moth group, does undergo its big radiation during the Cretaceous. Not surprising, because the flowering plants have evolved. So maybe they eat up all the plants and the herbivores start. Except there's no evidence that they suddenly increase in diversity at the very end of the Cretaceous. And again, how it affect aminoids and so forth. Racial senility. This is race in the original concept, concept of the word, which is a lineage, a branch of the tree of life. But I'm using the, the phrase as it was used in the early 20th century. It was an idea, a non-Darwinian idea about evolution, that organisms, that lineages, had sort of a life cycle. That they began, they underwent this massive transformation equivalent to childhood, they had a long, stately middle age, and then they kind of went silly at the end of their natural duration. They went senile. And they produced, the evidence for this, evidence, was that they produced all sorts of weird maladaptive structures that clearly had no function, like huge horns and frills, or domed heads, or in the case of aminoids, weird forms of the shell. Except, of course, these are all adaptive structures that have functions. They're not maladaptive. And there's no evidence whatsoever that a lineage has anything comparable to the life cycle of individuals. That's just pure metaphysics. It's not science. Now something that's getting a little better. In the early 20th century, two lines of evidence, three lines of evidence show up that get used to propose this idea. Poison gas from comets. One line of evidence is the ability to use spectroscopy, so uh, spectroscopes, to be able to sample chemical compounds that you can't touch by looking at its light. And people noted cyanogen compounds, the, the sort of the precursor to making cyanide, in the tails of comets. One line of evidence. Second line of evidence. World, the horrors of the battlefield of World War I where chemical agents, including cyanide gases, among other things, had been used against enemy soldiers. And indeed, people found that the horses, because remember, people were still using horses on the battlefield, and people that were on the battlefield would often be contorted if they had died from these horrible gases. And then people looked at the fossil record, and they found dinosaurs like this that show these contorted positions. So maybe the Earth passed through the tail of a comet, it poisoned the surface of the Earth. Poison is something that could affect multiple groups. It wouldn't be dinosaur-specific. Well, a couple problems with this. None of the specimens shown there are from the end of the Cretaceous. You know, the, the one in the middle is from about, 10 mil, about 15 million years before the end, and that's the closest. Some of those are from the Jurassic. Um, secondly, comets are as close to nothing you can have and still have something. 
The tail of the comet is extremely diffuse. There's not a lot of particles per cubic meter there. But because nothing is, so something is more than nothing, it stands out against the background of nothing. So if you have a few particles per square meter and lights hitting it, you see it against the backdrop of nothingness. But there's not that much there there. But at least it was an attempt to use multiple lines of evidence and not just think about, well, dinosaurs are gone. Now, when I was young, younger than you guys, this became a big model. And it was the supernova hypothesis. Now, what is a supernova? A supernova is when a star explodes. Typically, it has to be a star bigger than the sun. And temporarily, the energy of that star is, goes up by a billion times, or billions of times. It temporarily outshines the rest of its galaxy, which is made up of billions upon billions of stars. Uh, the one metaphor, or simile, or whatever it is, <laughs> that uh, someone once suggested that I thought was, is instructive. Picture like a normal lighter, like a, a lighter you use for like cigarettes, something like that. Um, and someone goes up to the top of the Empire State Building and flicks it on. If you're in the, um, the Washington Mall, and they're in the Empire State Building in Manhattan, you can't see the light. But if the light of that lighter increased by the same magnitude that a star goes from normal to supernova, you could read by its light in the Washington Mall. So it is a tremendous amount of energy. Well, in the early 70s, Dale Russell, a paleontologist, and Wallace Tucker, an astrophysicist, proposed maybe a supernova was the extinction causal agent. So we have the idea of a supernova, a star, somewhat near the solar system. Obviously not the star in the solar system. Why not? Because it's still shining. It's the sun. But someone within some light years of the solar system goes boom. And the Earth gets sleeted by gamma rays and other high energy particles and everything. Well, many things on the surface get wiped out. And things which are covered or in the depth or something, they survive preferentially. It's not a horrible idea. I mean, it's a horrible idea. It is not a, that's right, a bad idea, but it lacks that testability factor. Because in the 66 million subsequent years, the, the solar system has been moving around in this fluid we call the galaxy. We don't know which stars were close to us there, so we can't look for a remnant of a star that exploded then because they're nowhere near by us. And there's no real way that they had to try to sample the layers of sediment from the end of the Cretaceous to show that we were that some super light, the gamma rays and so forth, shone on us. Although now, there actually are ways we could use for um, looking at certain isotopes, rare particles, that could have been the evidence of a supernova. However, that idea was super, uh, superseded by three alternative hypotheses of things for which we have extremely good physical evidence, which might have a role at this extinction event. And these are, respectively, in the order they occur, or they sort of start occurring, the Maastrichtian regression, a great drop of sea level, and the Maastrichtian age, remember that last age of the late Cretaceous epoch. The Deccan traps volcanism, the world's largest outpouring of lava since the, since the uh, Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, which, hey, was associated with the Triassic-Jurassic extinction. And before that, the Siberian Traps, which, hey, was associated with the Permo-Triassic extinction. So that's certainly worth considering. And finally, what we call now the Chicxulub impact, the impact of an asteroid in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. So on Monday, we're going to explore these different potential causal agents, look at their records, and see which of them, either individually or collectively, might explain the extinction event. So I will see you on Monday.